50 percent of people with a bmi of over 25 are actually healthy you can run across a motorway blindfolded multiple times and 50 percent of people are okay so what's the problem good morning i haven't done one of these kind of videos before but you might have seen this doing the rounds and i just couldn't resist to drop in my two cents if you haven't it's basically this article from the daily fail and it's from a GP who calls herself the fat doctor, claiming that obesity doesn't have as many medical complications as we might think, and defending people's right to be obese. Now, this was on This Morning, which is a British TV show, and they basically set it up as a kind of cockfight scenario with a diet expert, supposedly, and gets the views, makes for good TV, and it's obviously featured on the Daily Mail as well, which... As you can see from these thumbnails on the right, they are not afraid of a little bit of healthy clickbait. And so let's have a look at the video. In schools, alongside weight loss guru Steve Miller, and welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us here today. Children should be taught in schools about the larger children's fictional characters because children need fat heroes. Because when you look back to that character in particular, there was a lot of fat shaming around that character. He was called Fat Ow, Fat Head. But despite all of this, you believe that things like this should be on the curriculum. Absolutely, because I think what, what we'll be able to do is open up a conversation about weight stigma and about fat shaming. I truly believe that children need as diverse a range of characters in books and, and, and to look up to as possible. And weight stigma is something that affects us from childhood and carries on all the way through our lives. It affects all sorts of things. Wages, we, people who are overweight tend to have a lower wage, they tend to have fewer career opportunities, they have um, poorer access to healthcare. The kind of things that you experience when you're a child can carry you through for the rest of your life. So I think it's a fantastic thing for people to realise that everybody is a good body. Okay. Perfectly reasonable so far. We want to have a wide range of bodies that we see on TV in the public sphere so that we're not subject to thinking that everyone looks like an Instagram fitness model. Okay, I can get on board with that so, so far. Um, with that in mind, Natasha, would this, would this character be attempting to lose weight or would everyone be accepting the fact that they were a larger character and it really didn't matter about future health issues? Yeah, this is a really interesting topic, isn't it? This idea that weight loss is a good thing. Actually, most of the evidence out there shows that us that weight loss is actually not good for our health. In fact, if you want to pretty much guarantee that you're going to be heavier five years from now, the best thing that you can do is go on a diet because that's actually the greatest predictor of weight gain is going on a diet. Right, so here's where we've got some issues, but I don't want to conflate the two things here. We've got that people have a right to have any body type that they want and fat shaming is bullying it's a form of bullying and it's a separate issue to whether obesity causes medical complications and also to whether dieting works but let's give her a chance to speak weight loss industry is going to try and convince you that i'm wrong because they don't want to acknowledge the fact that actually most people when they go on a diet actually end up gaining weight over five years so in the first year absolutely you can lose weight but within five years you tend to gain it back again and that's how the weight loss industry operates that's where they make their money because you lose weight and then you gain it back and then you have to go to another weight loss program well, think, or buy another you've, you've, lit, you've lit the blue touch paper as far as steve is concerned uh, so uh, all right steve you've uh, you've heard what natasha has to say it sounds like there's no point trying to lose weight anyway because it won't happen well, there's a, there's a couple of things, right? So the first one with characters and heroes uh, of any size, shape, colour, creed, you know, nationality, gender, whatever, of course it's important to celebrate diversity. I agree with that. What I'm not in favour of is to glorify obesity to children as a normal way of being. Now, because that is obviously dangerous. What I'm concerned about, and I'm sort of confused, is we have a doctor that's telling the nation today that actually you don't need to lose weight and you can be healthy. Now that really concerns me because of all the obvious things that we know being too fat, obese, leads to. We also know in the current situation that obesity, if you get COVID, you are much more likely to be uh, hospitalized if you are obese and you are much more likely to die if you're on a ventilator in hospital with COVID. And it's all right you nodding your head there, doctor, and it's interesting you call yourself the fat doctor. I just can't understand. It's like promoted fat. It's like the fat acceptance army. I'm so... I don't rate this guy. Yeah, again, makes for a good cockfight, makes for good TV. But he's just needlessly inflammatory. And he's just full of sass, isn't he? But anyway... Maybe it's me being a bit slow, but you're going to have to explain to me why you feel it's actually a good thing to be fat. I think you should answer that. And you've actually gone further to say that opinions like Steve are discriminating. 
Absolutely. I think there's lots of things we have to understand here. First of all, health is not just physical. Okay, health is it's mental, it's emotional, it's spiritual. And the second thing that we have to appreciate is that health is a privilege that you're born into. It is not an achievement from losing oh weight God. by day and exercise. And, and I'm, I'm sorry, but I just have to explain that. So basically, what all of the evidence shows is that when you're born into an affluent home, when you're born white, when you're born male, when you're born able-bodied, when you're born cisgender or, or heterosexual, all of those things mean that you are more privileged and your health will automatically be better. Irrespective of your weight. Right. There may be an association with certain inborn characteristics that make that, that predict better health outcomes. Does that mean that you then just throw a baby out with bathwater and you go, no point trying to lose weight anyway, screw it, I'm not a cisgender white male or whatever it was that she said, and therefore I have no agency over my health. This is where things start to get a bit murky. Now, let's just address a couple of these issues. So we've got what she said, that people go, people regain weight long term after a diet, and therefore the most, she said, the most predictable way to make sure someone gains weight is to start a diet. I think that's a bit of a, a big claim, but if we look at the data, basically it didn't matter what kind of intervention it was, but the key thing was the behavior maintenance strategies, i.e. not following a crash diet and looking at how can I make long-term behavior changes that are going to improve body weight and my, the way that I approach food long-term. Now, what's really interesting here, and you're seeing this in subtle ways, is that even smart people like this GP, who's clearly extremely smart, but the emotional brain acts first and then looks for things to rationalize and make our decisions later post hoc. Now, I'm not immune to this, no one's immune to this, but smart people are actually better at rationalizing their inherent biases. And you can see this with the, the selective way that she's looking at the data here. The other thing she's mentioned here is that fat people are discriminated against in the workplace and across various spheres in life. The world is a certain way. And we can either try and live in a world that we hope things are, or we can just live in reality. And unfortunately, yes, fat people are discriminated against. People have inherent biases, even if they consciously try and override them. And they perceive people, looking at this study, for example, showing people pictures of fat people and lean people and asking, what do you think this person's like? People ascribed characteristics to the fat people. They were calling them lazy, stupid, and then they looked at the lean people and said, this person is more intelligent, more wealthy, more gregarious. Unfortunately, this is a sad truth of the way that people are perceived. Stigma still exists, and that can change in the long term. But does that mean that you can't accept the world as it is and do yourself a favour? I don't think you should be obese as a one-man protest to say, people should take me as I am, and they shouldn't ascribe negative characteristics to me. It's something that's under your control and ultimately you're the one that has to suffer the consequences of it. Next, the claim that being obese doesn't cause medical complications. It's not something I really need to debunk. The, the data is very well established with this and you're always, even among doctors, among experts, among professors, you're going to have a wide range of opinion. This is the way that scientific dialogue works. And so if you select a hundred experts in their field, you're going to find some different viewpoints. And that's how things work and things evolve and they're based on the newest data. And it requires someone to have total objectivity, complete detachment from what their personal biases are to look at the data and say, okay, this is what we're seeing right now. Even though it's not what I like, I don't, I'm not happy to hear this, but this is how things are. So let's carry on. And that's unfortunately difficult for people like Steve because of course Steve likes to blame the individual and say that weight loss is something that we can do but we actually have all the data to show that it's not something we've also got the data don't, 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 don't talk at the same time because because it's even harder when we're on uh, calls like this because you cut each other out so let's say Steve your turn for the moment I think what I'm actually saying is that I think it is incredibly important to inspire and to infuse our nation to live their life 
non-obese. What you're saying today is we should glorify it. Let's celebrate being fat. If I came to you as a doctor, I reckon I'd walk out with a prescription that actually read, say to yourself and sing to yourself, if you're happy and you're fat, clap your hands every day. Natasha, you have already on social media, and this is part of a movement actually uh, to do this, which is to, to censor the word obesity. And within the word obesity, you put a, an asterisk there so you don't actually write the word. Why have you decided to do that? Because um, what Steve is accusing me of is actually absolutely correct. I, I look at the evidence and it makes it very clear that you cannot tell whether a person is healthy just by weighing them and measuring their body mass index. There are lots of studies that show, in fact, there's one study that shows that 50% of people with a BMI of over 25 are actually healthy. 50% of people with a BMI of over 25, they could be young and not have those complications developed. Like, the whole point of obesity is that it causes chronic inflammatory changes, which then lead to long-term disease. It's not something that you get fat and immediately you're ill. You can run across a motorway blindfolded multiple times, and 50% of people are okay, so... What's the problem? And 30% of people who um, have got a BMI under 20, uh, 25 are not healthy. And so actually what I do when I'm at work is I never call people obese because I know how triggering that word is. I know that obesity, that word, has contributed to a lot of weight stigma and what that's done. Okay, so again, here, I, I can get on board with it because if you have someone who comes to you in the clinic, you, the same applies with coaching, that you have people that respond to the challenge. They like being called out on bullshit and saying like, no, listen, you're obese. You need to do something about it or X, Y, Z is going to happen. The kind of masculine in people is, yeah, screw you. I'm going to do something about this. Whereas if you approach a patient with the kind of confrontational approach and they are predominantly acting in their feminine essence, they're, they're not going to respond well to that. They would prefer that the doctor approaches it in a more compassionate way and says, look, I understand the challenges you're facing here. Here's what we can maybe do to improve your quality of life, the way people see you, regain your sexual identity, all this stuff as well. So I don't think it's, yes, I agree that you shouldn't beat yourself up about stuff and you shouldn't beat up your patients unless it is a device used clinically to improve someone's outcomes. Beating yourself up doesn't mean that you don't make a change though. And it seems like neither of these guys are really recognising that it's possible to accept who you are right now and not flagellate yourself with a whip, but also to be like, I know where I want to go and I know the improvements that I want to make. Now, in her case, what I think this doctor has done is she's moved the goalposts and said, rather than aspiring to improve myself, I'm going to change the goalposts and say, dieting doesn't work anyway, so there's no point in doing anything about it. And let's just learn to accept obesity and then the, it closes the gap. There's no more problem. And we can look at the bits of data that say, oh, it's possible for some people under certain circumstances to be obese and healthy, and therefore we don't need to worry about it. To me, that's there's an element of burying your head in the sand here. But I appreciate that she has looked at data and she has seen it through the lens of her personal biases, which we all have, and then, yeah, they've taken her and put her with this gimp who <laughs> has made for very good TV. Let's see how it ends up. Done. It's so dangerous in the medical profession. My colleagues are not giving obese patients the same treatment that they're giving to their thin patients. Oh, and also... Oh, hello, oh, Natasha. Steve says being obese is the second largest killer to cancer. That's not true at all. That's absolute nonsense. I've got the evidence to prove that is absolutely untrue. He's just quoting false statistics. You can't be putting that message yes. out as a doctor. OK. Again, depends how you define cancer, depends, depends what cutoff you use for obesity. You, you ask most of the experts, most of the epidemiologists, most of the oncologists, what are the key factors in developing cancer, either from a high level observational studies or at the mechanistic level, there's no doubt that it is a significant con contributor. You will always find some study from the Ukrainian Journal of Urology 1972 that didn't find an association. You're like, okay, like with your sample size of six people, fine, but you've got to look at the balance of data here. And you also, need, can I say to... this? Can I say, no, you let me speak for a minute. The latest study from Harvard, if you want to go down the research and study route, has made it absolutely clear that you cannot be fat and healthy. And it is a disgrace, in my opinion, for any doctor to be shouting to the nation this morning, do you know what? If you're a bit poor, or if you're I don't know, whatever, you're always going to be fat anyway. And actually, it doesn't really matter because you can be fat and really healthy. It's that really, is just It's, it's really difficult, true. isn't it, for the individual, whether it be a child that's being introduced to this in the curriculum or an adult who's sitting watching this now, to know what is the right thing when you hear two people with such opposing views there. So what, what, what does someone do? 
that's the token bit at the end. Like they, they didn't really want practical application at the end of this. They just wanted fun TV and fair play to them. Like TV is going down the pan. They need to do stuff to boost their ratings. But I don't think this is a helpful dialogue for the typical audience watching this morning. I don't have the time to explain what the science here. If you come and actually look on my website, www.fatdocs.co.uk, or come follow me on social media, you'll see that I quote plenty of studies. I give lots of evidence-based medicine. I am willing to stake my career on the fact that I believe that we need to stop telling people to lose weight. I absolutely believe that we should be encouraging people to nourish themselves and exercise, but not to lose weight. Heart attack. You're telling the nation that they're, that they're if they're obese, don't worry about it, even though we know that most people, if you're a beast, you're much more at risk of dying of COVID if you get it. And you're saying no, to the nation sorry, today, if you think that, I'm not don't sure you worry two about are ever going to agree on this point, though we probably could discuss it till the end of the show. But listen, thank you both for being here. Right. I'm actually glad that she is planting her posts on one side of the argument. We, we need this to be able to promote dialogue in any kind of discussion. And as soon as you stifle any scientist or expert or anything what you're doing is you're slowing the total progress you you need to be able to state the position state the counter position and you need to let those two viewpoints battle it out and demonstrate what is the latest data what is the conclusion that we can draw from this so my conclusions for this really are look at the data preferably the things that are higher up in the hierarchy of data. So systematic reviews and meta-analyses are really the top of that. And they will give you the, the most f complete and filtered from all the noise picture of the data that you have. And then look at the person who is making a certain claim. If they have personal biases, agendas, and that can be personal or it can be financial or funded by a drug company or whatever, take it with a pinch of salt. Okay, so I hope that was useful. If you have seen this and you decided, actually, I do want to take things into my own hands and I want to do myself the favor of improving the way that I'm perceived socially, improving the way that I function, get stronger, feel better, look better naked, then we have a free program that will do exactly that. If you go to propanefitness.com forward slash start, the link is in the description below and it talks you through literally everything that you'll need to do this, including a beautiful infographic, full training program, progression model, apps that you can use to track it, and ways to basically eat flexibly while not having to worry about carrying everything around in Tupperware and living on broccoli and chicken breast. Okay, speak to you soon.